likely a Christmas Advent verse. It's, like I said, my job to uh, convince us otherwise. So that's what we'll do until our kids come back and share communion with us. We'll talk about that in a bit. So Advent, the word Advent is a word of uh, anticipation, hopefulness, um, uh, awaiting, longing. So, so we come to the Advent season. Part of, part of what's going on in the Advent season is we play through what the Old Testament was feeling like, what people in Old Testament times were feeling like when um, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were wanting the things of the Messiah to touch their lives desperately. In fact, much of Judaism was... Um, uh, was given so that they would understand God's standard. And that God's standard would be so difficult for them, think Ten Commandments. And think Jesus saying, not only if you misdo those, if, if you think about misdoing those, you've misdone them. High standard, huge standard. So what was troubling for Judaism in the times just before Jesus came was that they were carrying this huge spiritual burden. The only way to serve God, the only way to love God, the only way to make this sense is to keep all these rules and do it just right. And they were crushed by that burden. And so they began to anticipate that God would lift the burden through a Messiah. And as, as things got worse for them, the more they anticipated this coming. So our question this morning is, what are you expecting? And I, I'm just going to offer you three areas where you can just kind of look at this and think about it in terms of expectation by way of application this morning. And if you want to just follow along with the outline, we'll, we'll fill in the blanks and, and, uh, and just give you something to take home and think about for the week. But are, what are you expecting in, uh, what are we expecting in our lives? In our lives. What are we expecting God to do for us? Number two, what are we expecting God to do in this season? Hey, we're second uh, uh, week of Advent, uh, two weeks to go, then it's Christmas and New Year's and kids go back to school and all that starts to work out. But we're well into this season. Have we asked, besides the Christmas cards and all the stuff at the mall, and blah, blah, have we asked, God, what are you going to do in me this season? Or am I just going to get by and be exhausted at the end of December and say, I wish I'd learned something about God. And, and then maybe just to, to push this into the new year. Well, what are you expecting from God in the coming year? On all three of those levels, we could apply the message of this passage today, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. And then something else I want you to notice, uh, because we're really going to, in a very brief amount of time, we're really going to look at this passage this morning and give you some pretty incredible insights, because it's an amazing passage. And the first, uh, the, the, the first uh, of this is to understand this, that our expectations Open a door for God. Right? So God wants to be the center of our lives. If we relegate God to the bench or the bleachers or the sidelines, then God's not going to be. So, so that's up to us. Paying attention to the fact that God is offering us an invitation is our starting point. Now, one thing I want you to note about the passage, right there at the beginning of verse 6, it says, on this mountain. Isaiah is going to divide his passage, his, prophet, his prophecy, his prophetic word, into three sections. And every time he starts another section, he's going to say this, on this mountain. Okay, you got that? When he says, on this mountain, he begins to move. And so there are three expectations. The expectation for the kingdom, the expectation for judgment, and then what I call the hidden expectation. 
Okay? We're going to look at those three. And every time Isaiah wants you to shift with him, he's going to say, on this mountain. It's kind of like a code. It's kind of like a, a, a formula. All right? So now I think we're ready to go. So in those days, what were they expecting? Here's verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food. All people, I'd love if you're looking at your Bible, I'd love for you to underline all people. That's going to be important later. All people, a banquet of aged wine, best meats, the finest wine. So the Messiah will bring the kingdom. And this kingdom is seen in this big feast. So think, uh, you know, think uh, one, of, one of those great holiday feasts that you had with your family and it actually turned out okay, right? Okay, so that's what he's talking about. Some, uh, some picture, maybe, maybe you, you've seen in a Disney movie or in a, in, in a fairy tale book of this kingdom feast. This big thing that God is offering. The best things to eat and drink, he says. The Messiah, verse 6. And, and, and that's the word picture. It's a banquet. It's a great party. And then notice this. He says, all people. And the reason I want you to notice that is because there's something peculiar going on in uh, Judaism becoming Christianity. And here's what it is. When um, Abraham was first called into the covenant with God, Genesis 12, you can find it, verse 1. Abraham was told that not only will I work with you, but I will work with you to touch all people. The Jews began to take those passages and only teach part of it. And what began to happen, especially about the time just before Jesus and in the temple, they began to teach that the Jews were special and everyone else was second class. That the covenants were for God and not for everyone. You pay attention to God's word and you'll see that while the Jews were first in God's order, as he came to them first, and that's a distinctive, wonderful, beautiful place. His intent was to start with a group of people and go from there and make it big for everyone. So the banquet was not just set. We don't get like a, a backdoor pass. And all the, distinct, the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans and the war between them was all made up by man. That was not God's intent. In fact, I would go so far as to say that even in America today, denominationalism and uh, my church is better than your church and all that stuff is a residue of this that God abhors and, and doesn't want us involved. He's saying, become the people of God wherever you worship. This is for you. So the first expectation is the expectation of the kingdom. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is skip some verses. I'm going to come back to them, okay? Now, you never want to skip verses and don't come back to them because then, you, well, well, what was in those verses? Okay, so but we're going to drop down with me to verse 10. The Messiah would bring judgment. And, and I've got to read this to you in, in the full effect that, 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 the, that the writer wants you to hear this, okay? The hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. Two, on this mountain. But Moab will be trampled under him as straw is trampled down into the manure. In the first service I read that, and someone said, ew. Well, it gets worse. Check this out. <laughs> they, which is Moab, will spread their hands in it. Yeah, now I'm getting some move. It's, it, it's better. Check this out. As a swimmer spreads his hands to swim. Yeah. So they're swimming in it. Okay? The, the, the judgment here is that Moab is in it. You know, uh, they're, they're out at the outhouse. They fall in head first. Yeah. That's, okay? But you've got to have that. You've got to have that. In order. And God will bring down their pride despite their cleverness and their, and, and, and their hands. Notice the word hands in here. He will bring down the high fortified walls and lay them low. He will bring them down. 
to the ground, to the very dust. <clears throat> okay, three extraordinary word pictures here. The first is Moab. The word Moab is actually a designation of a country, but it stands for everyone who is against God. And it's not that God was against them. God offers them, as I said earlier, all people, God offers Moab and anyone else the, the, the same gift that he gives to the Jews, and, but, but there's, a, there's a problem here. So, so this whole thing, Moab stands for the occupiers. So even in Jesus' time, when the Romans were occupying Israel, that was Moab. When Alexander the Great came through and conquered Israel after they had come back from being conquered in Persia, both Persia and Alexander the Great were all Moab, the bad guys. Not because they're bad, but because they reject God's gift. Just, just keep remembering that in the world that we live in today. People aren't bad because they're bad. They're bad because they're rejecting God's gift. I was bad until I receive God's gift. And <clears throat> so are the rest of them. The second picture makes this even more uh, profound. He will deal with their pride. He says their cleverness, their self-sufficiency, their affluence made their hand strong. But where is their hand now? Yeah, yeah, in the toilet. Okay, it's down there. Now notice this. Look at verse 10. The hand of the Lord is on the mountain. But the hand of Moab is in the toilet. Now there's something profound here that's, that's, uh, that, that cuts to the bone of where we're at today. I am, I am profoundly moved that many Christians today receive their sustenance from the hand that's in the toilet instead of the hand that's on the Oh, no, I'm too busy. Can't go to church today. I, I can't read my Bible. Where are we going? Who is sustaining us? Dirty hand of Moab? The righteous hand wants to hold us onto the mountain when we think we know more than God knows. When we start to chart a course for our lives, it says, I know what i got to do, and God's just going to have to sit this one out. It's rampant in all of our lives. And, and, and part of this picture is that God wants to break the pride of that. And finally, God wants to break the power. So the three word pictures are Moab, pride, and power. God wants to break that down so he can be who he needs to be in our lives. So we have the two obvious pictures. The first is the, 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 the kingdom, the expectation of the kingdom in the banquet, and the expectation of judgment. And most of Judaism understood these two things very clearly. That somehow the Messiah was going to come and, and, and bring us into the kingdom and was going to destroy everybody else. Well, now I want to take you back to verse 7. Remember those skipped verses? 7 through 9. Check this out. He begins, chapter, verse 7, on this mountain. I will, I will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people. That's an interesting word picture. It's one of our three right here. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears. The second and remove the disgrace from his people, from all the earth. The Lord has spoken, and in that day they will say, Surely this is our God, we have trusted him, and he has saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted him. Let us rejoice and be glad in our salvation. Wow. Now you see, many would read the whole Old Testament and, and not think about the salvation of God. Only the coming of God to bring heaven to the uh, elites and judgment to the bad guys. If we look carefully, we begin to see this picture. And notice this, by the way, in verse 7, all people, all nations. In verse 8, 
all faces, all people, the whole earth, everyone. The word pictures here are, again, they are, they are fascinating and powerful. The first word picture in verse 7 is a shroud. He says, I've come to, to rip the shroud. There's a division between the people and their God. So you know what happened when Jesus died on the cross in the temple. There was a shroud that hung between the people and the symbols of the Most High God. And every one of the Gospels says that when Jesus said, I, 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 I give up my spirit, that it ripped right there. You see, there is a shroud, there is a sheet, you can call it sin, you can call it the inability to keep the law, you can call it fear, you can call it inadequacy, you can call it my insecurities. And the beautiful thing about the advent and the coming to Christ in this season is Jesus says, I want there to be no separation between you and I. And I will take care of whatever it is that separates us. He doesn't say, I don't want any separation between us. Get with it so you can be with me. He says, I will take care of it. There is no stronger evangelical language in in the, in the Old Testament than this. Our salvation. He has saved us. Uh, you used to be able to drive through downtown uh, uh, L.A. And the old rescue mission there was this big, bright, red neon sign. Jesus saves. You can see it from the highway. You can see it from everywhere. I don't know if they still make that work today or not. But, but the bottom line is... This hidden expectation is that the Messiah would save the world. Not just heaven for a few people that thought they got it right. And the rest are just going to get burned off. But that Jesus would provide a way of salvation. Verse 8, that there would be no more tears. The word picture is a mother wiping away the tears of an infant. And the third word picture is one of testimony. That they would say, we have trusted in God. In other words, if you look at their testimony in verse 9, surely this is our God. We trusted Him. He saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted Him. Let us rejoice and be glad in our salvation is a relationship. The Old Testament is telling us of this expectation that not only would the Messiah take care of the bad guys and reward the good guys, the Messiah would offer a way in which we could all be related to Jesus. This is the good news. The application of this morning for us is to uh, understand Whose expectation we're currently following? You see, our expectation reflects our bias. In fact, you may have experienced this. I'm sure you have, whether you've thought about it in this way or not. Those of us who think we know what we want, even as Christians, rarely know what we need because we know too much. We know better than God. I know what I want God to do for me now. Like this. God, give me patience now. You see. And, and, and yeah, it, it doesn't work. There is something beautiful and simplistic and wonderful and glorious in the Old and New Testament with children and those who are, are poor, those who don't know, those who seek help, all of those are rewarded for their lack. While people who believe they are already satisfied long for things that they can never get because they're saying, I only want what I want you to give me, God. And God loves us tremendously, but doesn't work on that basis. God is not our secretary. God doesn't take memos. 
God doesn't make our coffee. God doesn't take dictation. A prayer life that is full of us knowing what God <coughs> needs to do for us is going to waste our life because its understanding is not true. God's expectation, on the other hand, knows what we want and what we need, whether we know those things or not. God knows this about our lives and about our hearts. God knows that the blessings that, that, that we must have will come right on time. And God also knows this, and this is really difficult, but God knows this too. God knows the struggles, the difficulties, the trials and tribulations you must go through to become the people that God wants us to be. You know, the application of sandpaper uh, to a good woodworking job not only makes the, the seal adhere and, and, and finish the product, it's the same way if you're polishing out a, a fender on a car or, or whatever it is. All of these things bring to perfection, but it looks like we're destroying what's being perfected. It looks like we're, we're, we're going to, to rub that good work out. But God knows better. So now, one other verse that I skipped. Could you go to the top of the passage and look at verse 1? This is powerful. This is the, the, the highest expectation. Chapter 25, verse 1. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise you. Your name. Just, just think of that for a moment. Or, who is our God? Who are we exalting? Who are we praise, praising? What are we trying to get so right in our lives that reflects on us? That's so important that we kind of forget the things of God. For his perfect faithfulness, you have done marvelous things. You have planned long ago. You see, God is not only perfect in his faithfulness, God has planned long ago to bring to our lives and our hearts great joys and tremendous heartbreaks. That none of this is a mistake. That somehow God wasn't sleeping when something tragic happened to you a year ago or last week or five years from now. God, where was God? I, I was just so lost and, and alone. And, oh, where, where was God? God was right where God was. I love this. For in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things you planned long ago. Letting God be God is part of how this season works. He is Lord. God is perfect in faithfulness. He has done all things as marvelous things. He has planned our lives long ago. Now is the time we light each candle for each week. Now is the preparation of our hearts and of our lives together. Now is, is the expectation to think about what's going on in this season. What's going on in the coming year? What does God want to bring about in our lives? To just take a moment and say, in stillness and quiet, and especially before the kids come in, just close your eyes for a minute. Bow your heads. And just think of what you're really expecting and what
what God would have for you. Take a few moments in silence. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. I'll let you continue to gather your thoughts. Hopefully you'll get some quiet this afternoon. We're going to have our children come back now. They'll, they'll find you. Just wave your hand as you get the